Hello, everyone, and welcome to Stronger Together, the international future of EDS presented by Lara Bloom. We have participants across many time zones, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, everyone. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know that you're all muted. If you have a question, please type it into the question pane, and time allowing, we will answer it during the Q&A portion of the presentation. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Lara Bloom, the former COO of EDS UK, and now co-executive director of the Ellers Danlos Society. Welcome, Lara. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, this is an exciting day. It's the day that we're going to announce the beginning of the future and progression for Ellers Danlos Syndrome. I would like to tell you all about the international charity, the Ellers Danlos Society. I'm sure that most of you know who I am, but for those who don't, let me tell you a little bit about me. I have previously worked at EDS UK, transforming them into one of the largest, well-reputed EDS charities during my five years working there from 2010 until last summer. I really loved what I was doing there, but I realized that to really make a change and beat this condition, we need a larger international charity to work on bringing everyone together. Many of you may also know me from the documentary Issues with My Tissues, which followed me on my journey attempting to finish the London Marathon. If you haven't seen it, you can watch it for free on YouTube by just entering in Issues with My Tissues. I represent EDS in as many ways as I can on a professional level. I fought for EDS in the Houses of Parliament in London to try and raise the profile of incorrect allegations of child abuse in EDS. I sit on the Patient Expert Group for Rare Disease UK, and I'm on the Specialised Rheumatology CRG Group in the UK. And I've just graduated as a Fellow of UPATI, which is the European Patients Academy on Therapeutic Innovation. And I was also proud to be a director on the EDNF board from 2014 to 2015. So enough about me. How did we get here? I always say that you need to be the change you want to see in the world. And that is how I came to do, to do the job that I do. As someone who lives with this condition, I really know what it is that we need. And we need change. I built the foundations and formed excellent relationships throughout my time at EDS UK. And now the next phase of change is taking place. We realized that this community, both the patients, charities, and medical professionals, were just too fragmented. Your quality of care and time to diagnosis is determined by geography, and it's simply not good enough. Patients do not know where to turn for the most reliable, up-to-date information. Good management, validation and diagnosis at a young age could be the difference between a disabled adult and one living a full and active life. Doctors and labs were just not talking to each other and working together, and charities have been competing instead of joining hands and fighting together. It was in November 2014 that we all sat around the table at the first board meeting that I joined with EDNF and said, we all need to come together and have an international symposium to reclassify the diagnostic criteria and create management and care guidelines. It's been nearly 20 years since the last nosology. No wonder we are where we are. I thought I would be laughed at, but instead both EDNF and EDS UK took up the responsibility of funding this incredible venture, and that is how we are where we are today. This truly international EDS symposium will take place this year between May the 3rd and 5th in New York City. Not only will we reclassify the diagnostic criteria, but for the first time we are building management and care guidelines. It really is groundbreaking. We have nearly 90 medical professionals, 13 different groups and patient experts on each group representing our voice. The symposium is going to formalize and legitimize the truly multi-systemic side of EDS and publish it through a leading group of cl clinical experts so that nobody can ignore this condition any longer. It's also going to be published in leading articles with open free access for all to see and distribute. Not only will we have new names for all the types and new diagnostic criteria, 
but we will also have somewhere that medical professionals can turn to for advice on how to manage and care for the condition. So no matter where you live, you can get the right treatment. We are not naive. We know this is going to take time, but it will change. It will get better. We also know this is an ongoing process, and I think that that is the most essential part of this. It needs to not be another 20 years before we do this again. We need to continue the dialogue and collaboration. But we didn't have an organization in place to take responsibility of this monumental task. And it was for this reason that the Ellers Danos Society was born. One voice is strong, but many voices together are stronger. One person fighting is a start, but many together build an army. This quote here sums it up perfectly. Unity is strength. When there is teamwork and collaboration, wonderful things can be achieved. And we are going to achieve wonderful things. At the same time as I was having these ideas, simultaneously the EDNF charity and the clinical team in Ghent were all thinking the same thing. It was one Skype call late at night early last year to Shane Robinson, the executive director of EDNF, and Sandy Shack, the chair of the charity when the mission for, international, for the international charity was conceived. I knew that I would have to leave EDS UK to fulfill this task, and that was the hard decision. But I knew it was the right time to give this a chance and to give this condition the platform that it needed. So in May this year, at the International Symposium, we will officially launch the international charity, the Ehlers Danlos Society. You may have heard this being referred to as EDS International in these last few months, but we are now ready to unveil all the details and our official name. From May this year, EDNF will be reborn as the new international charity. It will be run by myself and Shane Robinson with an international board, a newly appointed international scientific and medical board dedicated to research and a new mission. So what is our mission? Our main objective and priority is collaborative research. In the past, there has not been a national charity that has been able to raise the money to really fund research that's going to crack this. There is so much more we need to do. We need to find the molecular information for the most prevalent type. We need to know more about the rarer types. We need to know more about the epidemiology. We need to research treatments, management, and more. The list is endless. However, the donations have not been. The society is taking responsibility to raise these funds, but we need your help. We will bring together all the doctors and labs from all around the world. They're all represented on our board and are ready with research proposals. The only thing holding us back is funding. Help us change that. In order to to prove how prevalent this condition really is, we need to build registries. We will bring together all the registries that exist from all over the world and create one large Ehlers Danlos registry. And that will help us learn what we need to about the epidemiology. We need the world to listen, and this is one way we can prove how many of us are really living with this condition. This year, we're going to hold two large conferences to deliver the findings of the symposium to the patient communities. And we also ask you to encourage your local medical professionals to attend as well. And for the first time, we will be inviting all the local and national charities and support groups to exhibit and have their own stands at the conference so that we can truly come together as one community. Our USA Global Conference will be in Baltimore in July and our European conference will be later this year or the beginning of next. We are waiting to confirm exact locations and dates, but as soon as we know, we will share it with you all. And we cannot wait to have so many zebras under one roof. Not only will we be building on the existing communities that are already there, helping them grow and support the patient communities, but we also want to help develop new ones. We're going to be reaching out to people from all over the globe, and we will help send over medical professionals, hold conferences, and give them the tools to build their own society. Some examples of countries we hope to get to in the next 18 months are Israel, New Zealand, and India. And I ask you to turn and, and ask me what, com what communities need our help. Let us know where we can be of assistance. 
We are also committing to ensuring that a symposium happens every two years so that we are constantly updating and revising the criteria in management and care guidelines. The next one after New York is in 2018 in Ghent and we know that it is essential to get the respect and recognition from others in the medical world and with expert input constantly updating it, it's hard to ignore. This is going to lead to constantly updated literature. We want you to be able to freely access these findings from our website at any time, no matter where you live. With the society, this is now possible. You do not need to pay any membership. It is just there for you to download, share with friends, family and medical professionals. We will also encourage all the EDS charities and support groups to become members of the society. We will offer branding, advice, support and guidance to all no matter how big or small they are. Patients need support, meetings, events, and it's through lo local groups that this needs to happen. You will also know that if a charity is a member of the society, then their medical information is reliable and up to date, as we will dist distribute this to them for free, for charities to brand as they like and give to their communities. You may also wonder, will there be a US charity? Instead of one US charity, the needs of the American community will be met by the local groups and chapters, some that already exist and some that we will help create. The society will be committed to fulfilling the larger need that will impact all the countries all over the world and then we will help build the local groups to directly support you, the Zebra community. The society will also ensure that there is a conference every year for people to attend. In time, it would be wonderful to see all charities under one brand, all part of the society. For example, the Ellis Danos Society India, the Ellis Danos Society Africa, Ireland, UK, Spain, France. We want our zebra to become recognisable all over the world. If we all have one voice, one image and one message, we will be hard to ignore. We know that this will take time. It's no dictatorship and charities are free to brand it as they like. But I think it is time the fragmentation stops and collaboration begins. Lastly, but most importantly, we need to correctly educate the next generation of doctors. We need to re-educate practicing medical professionals as well and change the service we all receive as patients. We will be offering a student exchange program with all the leading labs and clinics globally and we will become a place that professionals can come and know that they are receiving credited information. We will look into training programs. We will talk and hold lectures across all the multidisciplinary conferences across all the world. It's time to teach doctors what this is really all about. It's also time to re-educate why we are all zebras. And I ask all charities and members of our community to start putting out the same message. When we first began associating with the zebra, it was because of the phrase taught to medical students throughout their training, when you hear the sound of hooves, think horses, not zebras. In medicine, the term zebra, or as some say zebra, is used in reference to a rare disease or condition. Doctors are taught to assume that the simplest explanation is usually correct to avoid patients being misdiagnosed with rare illnesses. Doctors learn to expect common conditions. Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is considered a rare condition and so EDS sufferers are known as medical zebras. But we are not rare. It is a complete contradiction to everything we are trying to communicate, so we must stop telling people this. Sure, many of the types are rare, but the most prevalent type is just mis- and underdiagnosed. But actually, the zebra is still the perfect mascot for our group. Did you know that there is not one type of zebra with the same stripes? But when you see a zebra, you know it's a zebra. There are so many of us zebras with different stripes. We all live with different symptoms, different types. But to the trained eye, when you see an EDSA, you know they are an EDSA. We need to start showing our stripes more so that when everyone sees us, they know we are an EDS zebra. When you say to someone, I have EDS, they will not then say, what is that? It's time for us to all come together. We know that this is not going to be easy. 
Many of our community are on benefits. You reach out to others and they say, what is EDS? The cancer charities, heart charities, mental health charities will always win out over us. But we need to change this. Even if everyone listening donated just a dollar or five or ten, we would be on our way. People don't realize what a change they can make. They wait for others to take responsibility. I know how you must feel. You feel too weak, too tired or in too much pain. But everyone can do something. You can hold a bake sale, shave your head, walk a mile, do a yard sale. Every little bit helps. It is time to take responsibility, all of us together. Please help our society change the lives for those with EDS. Help change your life. Donate what you can today. Spread the knowledge, the correct knowledge about EDS and be part of our mission. Do you know what a group of zebras together is called? It's called a dazzle. Pretty perfect, I would say. So let everyone join hands and together, let's dazzle. I'd now like to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, everybody. Thank you very much, Laura. We're going to, we're, we're pulling some questions now. So we'll start to ask you the questions directly, Laura. And then if you can, if you can um, respond, we'll, we'll just do it that way and see how many we can get through. Okay, the first question is a great one. What is the difference between the conference in New York in May and the conference in Baltimore in July? Okay, so the, the symposium in May is for medical professionals only. And within the groups that we've invited, we've also invited patient representatives from support groups. So we're hoping that we're going to have at least one member of every registered charity and support group that there is around the world so that we've really got the patient voice in there as well. Unfortunately, it's not open for patients to register, um, but we that's why we're doing the conferences in Baltimore in July and then in Europe so that all the speakers that are going to be at the symposium are then going to present exactly what they found uh, through the symposium work to the patient community so that everyone understands how it will affect them and what we learn together and how we're going to move forward, more importantly. Excellent. I think the next question is one of my favorites. It's where do you donate to this new group? Excellent question. So at the moment, um, like I said, because it's it's going to be um, coming from the EDNF charity from May onwards, you can donate to EDNF. And if you put in your description that this is for the new international charity, it will all go towards these new funds, or this 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 new new mission. Um, no problem. So EDNF website um, is the best way to do it. You can also email me. All my contact details are on the screen now if you have any questions. Um, and if you want it to be restricted to the symposium efforts, you can put that in there as well. There's lots of options and how to donate. But uh, anything you can give. People think when they can't give a lot of money that there's no point. But if, if everyone who thought that gave just a dollar or a pound or, you know, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, we would we would make a, a lot of money, and also for for those donors that live outside the U.S., um, we will be registered in the U.K. Um, shortly, so that you can have uh, tax benefits as well, um, and we will then look further into becoming registered in other countries, so that everybody can donate from wherever they are and um, and not you know miss out benefiting from from any tax benefits that there may be so uh, I'm not sure exactly when that will be but we are working on that but until then through EDNF so when do the tickets for the symposium in New York City go on sale well there aren't any tickets and Lara would you like to explain a bit more Sure. Um, we have sold out. I, I say sell out. Uh, we weren't actually selling the tickets. We had uh, generous funding from EDNF and EDS UK to enable us to bring medical professionals over and we are at capacity, which is incredible, which means that nearly 250 medical professionals from all over the world, all different disciplinaries are going to be under one roof, um, which is, is truly incredible. It really is. Um, we're going to have a session for charities and support groups as well that are registered. And um, we're also going to have a, a dedicated session in July in Baltimore uh, for charities and support groups, whether you're registered or not, so that we're really, you know, fulfilling our, our promise to bring, bring everyone together on that level as well. But unfortunately, we are at capacity at the symposium for medical professionals, and it is not open to patients. 
Okay, somebody would like to know how many cases are known worldwide. I don't think we have a handle on this. Like no, we don't. So uh, let's let's think about the the um, the hypermobility type as it's called at the moment. Um, statistically, it's said that it's supposed to be one in five thousand. Now, clinically, um, it's thought to be a lot more. Um, people have even said, such as Professor Graham, that it could be as many as one in a hundred, one in two hundred, which is you know vast difference there in prevalence. And again, we need to prove that. It, there's clinical evidence, unfortunately, only goes so far. And that's why we need to prevent people saying, I don't believe in it, I don't believe they're those numbers. We need to prove it. And we can only prove it through through learning more about the epidemiology. So that's learning more about, you know, how many people are suffering from this, what the prevalence is. And we learn that through registries, which is why we're committed to building this international registry. Um, but not only that, what, you know, before that, that's why we've had to go backwards so much with this, you know. We need to make sure that every doctor, where possible, wherever they are in the world, is diagnosing people in the right way, so that actually the people are getting diagnosed to then get on the registry, and it's really a domino effect from there. And, and amazingly, at this at this time in 2016, we're still having to go back to the beginning somewhat to, to get this right. So um, we don't know is the honest answer, but I think I think the more we learn, the more when when it's when it, touches you firsthand, you then realize how many people you know that have probably got it and and the diagnosis kind of keeps keeps going on like that through people that know about it. So um, I think there's a lot of people living out there. My, my prediction is that in the next 10 years we'll look back at this and it will be the most misunderdiagnosed medical condition that, you know, that we've lived through. I really think that so many people living with IBS symptoms, chronic pain, things like that, this, this could serve as an opportunity. However, I say that, but it's also incredibly important that it's not overdiagnosed. We have to make sure that people who are hypermobile with chronic pain don't automatically get the diagnosis, diagnosis of EDS, which is why we're, we're really looking into the diagnostic criteria in nosology through the symposium, because there's no point in proving how prevalent something is if it's, I say, a very easy condition to fall under, you know, because there are so many symptoms. So we have to get it right. It's a real balance between proving how prevalent we believe it is, but making sure that everyone that gets that diagnosis fulfills the criteria that we're building at the moment. And that's a really fine line, but very, very important. Overdiagnosis is, is just as damaging. Okay, we have a couple, a couple of medical board questions here. One is asking mm -hmm. what specialties are involved. Another is asking if uh, a, Dr. Driscoll is on the board which I believe not as of yet, but we have a small board that we're starting off with and we will be expanding. Would you like to talk about yes. specialties, Lara? Yeah. Uh, we have pretty much every single um, kind of multi-systemic symptom area covered on the board. So we have GI issues, um, we have chronic pain, rheumatology, um, we have genetics on the board, but more importantly, it's it's representative internationally. We have someone from Japan, from Europe, uh, America, um, you know, the UK, France. We have we have the whole you know globe represented on this board, and we've got well reputed published medical professionals that are going to be taken seriously um, by the by the medical community. And I, I believe, uh, Shane, if, if you can correct me, but I think we'll be able to announce those names very, very soon uh, prior to May so that you can start to get excited about the kind of level of expertise we really have behind us. I mean, it's it really is the first time this kind of level um, of expertise and, and medical professionals have come together in this way, all serving on the board, ready to decide on the research that impacts all of you. Yes, absolutely. I think we'll, we'll be able to announce those names and, and where we're going. There's a couple of learning conference questions for our upcoming conference in Baltimore in July. Uh, one of the questions is when is the information for the conference going to be available? Well, registration will open in March. So we've got just over a month, probably about mid-March. So about a month and a half, uh, four months out from the conference, registration will open and you'll be able to register and book hotel rooms if you're interested in coming. And we hope that all of you do come. Yes, and it's again, it's it's global. So we're encouraging people not just in the you know United States to come, really from everywhere. And, and likewise with the European one, 
uh, not just from the UK. We really want every country to come together. I think meeting fellow zebras is just as important as the content you hear in the talks. So um, I think it's important to get as many people together as possible. And we're, we're trying to give you the opportunities to make that possible. Right. Here's a good one. Will the reclassifications, renaming of the types of EDS be announced this year? Yes. Um, so we will be announcing them. That's what we're announcing and, and uh, presenting to you at the conference in July. Um, it will also hopefully be online, but the published article will not be released until early 2017. Um, so we hope that the online versions, though, as I said, and the presentable versions will, will be in the summer. But we are, you know, it, it's a constant working process, so we're going to be working right up to the kind of the button on this. So um, <clears throat> it, it, we, our plan is, though, for everything to be presented at the Baltimore conference. And more questions coming in on the conference. How much is it? Well, we're not sure. We're still building our budget, so it's going to be most likely comparable with last year because it's the same venue as the EDNF conference last year. We'll be having it there with a slightly expanded space. Um, there will be a special rate at the hotel, and there will be discounted tickets. Actually, more than discounted, we're going to have, as EDNF has done in the past, and the Elder Stanless Society will continue, we'll have uh, scholarship scholarships available. Now, the number of scholarships that we'll have available will depend on uh, how many donations we get towards that. Last year, I believe we were able to do about 20. So we hope we can do more. It's going to depend on the generosity of, of others to make sure that we can get people there for free or at least cover their their uh, the, the registration costs. Okay, now we also, Laura, we have some local chapter questions. Some people saying, how can I form or find a local support group? How can I get involved with local support groups? Uh, will there eventually be local chapters of the Ellers Danlow Society? Uh, that's definitely our intention. Um, I would say that those kind of answers will come kind of post May. When you go onto our website, we are going to have a world map of every single support group and charity all over the world and direct links for you to go straight to their pages. Um, I would encourage any support groups um, that perhaps EDNF, um, EDS UK, other kind of larger national groups that, that perhaps we're not aware of, contact me so we make sure that your details are on there. There'll also be a a way of kind of uh, letting us know, like a form to submit your details if we haven't got your details on there. But also there's going to be ways that you can register your interest to set up a support group and there will be things in place that we can help you and support you to do this. So, you know, we're, we're not a bottomless pit of money, but we, we are a bottomless pit of expertise and knowledge. So what we can say to you is someone calls us up from, you know, wherever in the world and says, I want to put on a conference and I want to set up a support group. That's what we're here for. But what we haven't got are the funds to do that. So what we will turn around and say is we will help you to think of ideas to raise those funds, turn to local grants in your country, et cetera, et cetera. And in turn, what we can bring are the doctors over to do the talks at the conference. And then we can come with our expertise to sit with you and talk about how you can set up your own local charity. And that will all hopefully start becoming these chapters of the society so that we really are becoming a global brand and people see the zebra, they know that we're all part of this larger kind of um, collaborative effort that is the Ellers Danlos Society. So yes, get in touch with me, send me an email and from May onwards or uh, perhaps earlier when our website is live, which we don't yet have the exact dates for, uh, there will be instructions on there as well as to how to go about doing that. Okay. I a few questions about uh, name, website, rebranding, etc. So there will be an Elder Stanlow Society website, absolutely. The plan launch is at the symposium. So we're, we're going to go, the, the plan is to go live in May with that site. Uh, there was a question, is the EDNF name going to be officially changed to the Elder Stanlow Society? Yes, it will. And this, what was EDNF uh, is being reborn into a global organization that's 
truly international, both in terms of staff and in terms of board and in terms of scope of operations. But it, it, it was born out of uh, the history of EDNF. So you will see EDNF officially and legally changing its name to match the new organization. Um, and Laura, I don't know if you have anything to add on that. There's several questions. No, I think you answered that unless uh, people have questions from that. Um, there are lots of questions coming in. Um, Okay, we, we're getting several questions about specific uh, physicians, doctors, medical professionals, and researchers and their involvement. So I think many of those we'll be able to answer once we get once we get that list out. Uh, yes, and, and do they mean involvement in the symposium and the efforts there, or involvement in the society? Because you can actually go on to um, eds2016.org, www.eds2016.org, and you can see a full list there of everybody, every medical professional and patient representative that is part of the symposium working group. So you can see a full list there. Um, and um, everyone that's on our board is also part of that group. So uh, we will release that list of our scientific and medical board very soon. Um, it's, we just um, need to do everything properly and in the right order. Um, but everyone is, is completely signed up and committed and excited. And our first um, time together will be at the, the symposium in May. And that's really where everything is launching and beginning. OK, we have what tools do we have to educate local physicians, especially medical schools? So one of the most exciting things that's coming out of this is that we will be creating these new you know, guidelines. And like I said, they will be free to, to print out and distribute to as many people as you possibly can. And these, you know, it will have the kind of international mark of collaboration on them, which, you know, we, we sought advice and, and we were told by medical professionals that that is taken seriously and that is credible. Um, so we that will be available on our website and that will be available to any of the charities and support groups that are part of the society, um, whether they are called, uh, you know, the society or whether they continue to call themselves whatever they wish to. We are not limiting who gets that information. It is open freely to all. And we're doing that because we want it to reach the hands of medical professionals. It's essential. It's, it's how we're going to make a change here. So that post May, um, it may take, it will, it will take a few months after that before we can actually give you the actual tangible work that's come out of the symposium, so the updated stuff. But there will be information on there in an interim period um, that's, you know, pretty reliable as well that you can, can kind of freely distribute as well. But as soon as we are legally, because obviously we're publishing this and there are laws with publishing where, where you can put in when. Um, so uh, I think online we're able to do that a bit earlier. So then that will be available to print out and, and share around. But all of these kind of dates and all the, the ins and outs uh, we will confirm. But it's, if you think post May, it, we, we will either be there or almost there. And uh, we ask you for your patience because obviously we are adhering to publishing rules from the article that it's going in. Um, but long term, absolutely, that's the intention. That's why we're doing this. We will give you every tool that we can um, to educate as, as many medical professionals, friends, colleagues, physios, you know, caregivers, and anyone and everyone. We need to get the correct information in their hands. Right. And, and back to the symposium. So this the symposium is the end result of a very long process. A, a lot went into getting that organized. Uh, and Laura, do you mind talking a little bit about that so, so people know how much time and energy uh, you, EDNF, uh, EDS UK and all other stakeholders uh, that were involved. Yeah, sure. So we've been now working on this since January 2015. Um, and when I say working on it, literally writing the articles. Um, so 
the way it works is there is a committee for each type of VDS. So there is a hypermobility committee, a classical committee, a vascular committee, and a rare types committee. And that committee is responsible for producing an article uh, that's the new nosology and diagnostic criteria. And then we've got working groups. And those working groups are responsible, responsible for producing an article on the management and care guidelines. Now, the exact specifics of how that will work, we're, we're writing it as we speak. Um, so I'm not going to say too much more about that because um, I can't. Um, it's We've all signed confidentiality forms, which is why no information about our findings will be released until post-symposium. Um, and that's because we want it to be published and taken seriously. So, you know, long-term gain is really what's important here. Um, but I can't tell you how much work and effort these medical professionals have uh, put into this. You know, forget what we've done, uh, which is a lot, but they are running clinics and they are not getting paid a penny for this. They are all donating all of their time, expertise and efforts to have Skype calls, conference calls, have me emailing them and telling them off that they haven't, you know, made a deadline for, you know, a long time. And we've had face-to-face uh, -face meetings with the steering committee, and the steering committee is made up of the chairs of each of the committees, uh, with myself and Shane for the um, me representing the patient voice and, and, and Shane the support groups and charities. So we're really covering everything and it's it's been a huge task and you know we're learning every day and I think what's really essential and I said it before but I'll say it again because people are expecting a polished final outcome from this and that's not what this is going to be. How can it be when the last time we did this was nearly 20 years ago? But what this is is a commitment from all of these medical professionals that are post May going to continue to do this and continue to stay in these groups and committees so that every two years we are updating this condition and if we need to republish we will and we will then keep our website fresh with the content and the, the updates for you to give to your medical professionals and it's it's really huge and I'm, I'm constantly uh, you know humbled and, and so grateful for, for what they're doing for us for nothing and um, I think you should be too and, and really this is not just three days um, of medical professionals coming together. This is over a year of really hard work and dedication and for that we should all be very, very grateful. Got a question here about whether or not uh, Dr. Claire Francomano will still be involved. She's definitely involved. She's a member of the Ellers danlos Society board and she's also on the medical board and the steering committee for the uh, international symposium. So she's very well involved. Uh, another question here for you, Laura, if the findings won't be published until 2017, which findings will be available in May? No findings will be available in May uh, to the public, but uh, in July at the Baltimore conference, we are, it's, it's, it's strange rules with publishing, but you are allowed to present the findings verbally and you are allowed to put an online article version of the uh, article online. So the information will be there, but when I say published, as in the tangible published article, will not be out until January 2017. And we have been told that presenting it through conferences is fine and putting it online. So I don't know the exact online date that it will be online, but it will, it will be very shortly after May. Um, but we will definitely be ready to present them you know, verbally um, at the conference in July. So you will all hear about it after May. It won't be literally the next day because it will be, I think, at the earliest July um, because there's a follow-up process. And, and what's really important to us is that uh, it's a peer-reviewed process. So we've got 250 people going to the, to the event. And if people don't agree with what we've done, then that's important and we need to take that into consideration. So there will be edits if needed. Uh, on the on the whole, people will get to peer review it before the um, the symposium as well. So we're really giving everyone the chance so that it does you know happen in a timely manner. But um, it's it's not going to be literally the sixth of May. You can see it all. It's a process, and we have to respect that process. And again, long term gain here. You know, we have to have a bit of short term pain and patience. But uh, it's going to happen. And by July, everyone who's in Baltimore will be able to hear that information 
and everyone in the European conference, everyone in Europe, UK, and everyone there will also hear them too, either hopefully at the end of the year or the beginning of the year after. Great. So a bunch more questions. Will the information from the conference be available online if I cannot attend? Uh, uh, yes, the, it will be. Yes, it will be. For the, for the Baltimore conference. And we are also uh, filming the symposium, so eventually all of the talks there will be able to be viewed as well. But again, it's adhering to the publishing laws, so um, exactly when that is, it, but it will be at some point. But eventually, all the talks at the symposium and all the talks from Baltimore will be available freely online on our website. A few other questions, uh, some about raising money, uh, also a good point about uh, the EDS community spending a lot of money on treatment and not having a, a lot available to uh, to donate to causes such such as this. And there's a question about corporate dollars. Well, uh, that's a great question. We're going to be working very hard to get corporate backing, and that's a big part of our fundraising plan. Um, yeah. In the United States, not to speak for the world, but in the United States alone, Corporate donations generally are around 10 to 15 percent of most nonprofits uh, fundraising. The bulk still comes from individual donors. Now that doesn't need to be from you, but people that you know uh, and people that they know. So the more that we get the word out, the more that we show that zebras are coming together and uniting to build awareness. Uh, the more we're going to be able to make a mark and get people to see that this is a, a real challenge that we need to address and it'll make them more likely to donate. And so just to recap, in the United States, traditionally the bulk of donations are individual donations, but now uh, fundraising on a global level will have a lot of opportunities in Europe and other places for grants, uh, corporate donations, and, and other means of fundraising. Laura, I don't know if you have anything to add. No, no, yeah, just to add to that, I think people, you know, uh, and uh, you know, I, as you know, I'm, I'm very um, immersed in our community, and I meet a lot, a lot of us at, at events and, and conferences and things like that. And I know how hard it is. I know that we're not a community that have a lot of money, and some do, but on the whole, most don't. We're living on benefits. It's very hard. We can't work, um, and I get that. And but I, I think people forget how, how, how much of a difference a dollar can make. And I think everyone can pretty much afford one dollar at some point in a year. And if, you know, we've got nearly 30,000 people following the EDNF Facebook page. If every single one of those donated a dollar, it's nearly $30,000. That's a research project right there. So I think people don't give what they can give because they think it's not going to be enough. And it's one of the things that, I was most proud of at EDS UK that I managed to do is really bring the community together and take responsibility and and over the years we really saw the change in people doing and being very proud to raise a hundred pounds, 150 pounds, 60 pounds, 50 pounds and being proud to shout about that because you should be because it's important for everyone to come together because when you do those events or you do something that raises money you're not just raising money you're raising awareness and that's what's important and I think something that I really want to, to 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 succeed in with uh, with the society and and uh, together with Shane, I, I know that you agree is really getting everyone to take responsibility. And I know I spoke about that, and and I'm here all day long to give you advice in how I think you can do that and different ideas and fun ideas. You know, I I don't think for a minute anyone should start to do a marathon like I did, um, but you know everyone has their own marathon and their own version of what's a really a big triumph for them and we're hopefully going to be uh, creating events that people can take part in as well uh, that are doable and uh, affordable uh, manageable so there's there's lots that we're going to unveil and and you know get everybody part of but really just don't be scared to give a dollar because you know I went to an event this year in, in in America and one of the you know the, the the nicest moments I had was when a guy came up to me and said this is all I have but he gave me a dollar and that dollar meant you know a lot to me because it's something and you know I think everyone needs to give give a little bit so 
dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, a hundred dollars, whatever you can do. And if you can't give money, spread awareness, but spread the right awareness, and that's what we're going to provide you with the tools to do. Okay, a few more questions about involvement that I think we can address. Uh, is Dr. Hakeem from the UK involved? And he is, right, Lara? Uh, yes, he is. He's the chair of one of the groups. Right. And also, is uh, Sandy Chack involved in this? She's amazing. Um, that's good to hear because she's the chair of the board, so she's involved too. Um, a, a few things about local chapters and the makeup of those. Uh, many of these things are down the road, and they're going to be geographically dependent on how they're organized. And and I think there will be more more light will be shed as we figure those things out as we as we work with local stakeholders. Uh, there are also a, a host of very specific medical questions uh, and also questions of people that want to be in touch because they have things that they can offer, be it uh, access to research methodologies, um, uh, availability to volunteer, and many other things. So many of you have put up your contact information. Unfortunately, we're going to lose the question pane, so we're going to lose that. So if I could ask you to email, you can either... Email yeah, Laura right. at. Can you still see my details on that on that on the slideshow? It should be there. If you can't yeah, see I've it, got yeah. emails there, my Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. So uh, you should be able to get in touch. It's I'll set, spell it out there, and then Shane can you can give your details as well. So we've got everything covered. It's Lara L A R A at international E D S dot org. So it's Lara at international E D S dot and my Facebook is Lara Bloom EDS. Right. And just so we don't totally inundate Lara with email, you can you can also reach me. I'm at S Robinson at ednf.org. Our email addresses are going to change when the new website comes out. So we'll do we'll let everybody know about that. Uh, you can also just email anybody at EDNF. So if you go to ednf.org any of those email addresses will get to me, Lara, or the the appropriate person. So you have a lot of ways to do that. And of course, all of that will change and the EDNF website will, will change as well. There will be a new website. And just to say to that, because I know a lot of people are like, ah, brain fog, how will I how will I know the new the new website and the new email addresses? If you go onto EDNF's page accidentally, you will be automatically directed to the new society page after May when we're live. And the same goes for the website. If you by accident email our, our old email addresses, they will get to our new ones. So uh, don't worry too much. If you don't hear what the new URL is or the new email address is, you'll find us somehow. But we will be very, you know, proactive with giving out our new details, so yeah, don't worry too much about that. There's a, a very good question about uh, how come it was not taken into consideration that instead there be an international society global instead of one growing out of an American group. This is a great point, and that was our original intention. Our original intention was for many groups to come together and form an international one. Once we got deep into the planning and the timeline of this, we found that it would be much quicker to take an established organization and grow that into the international organization rather than wait to start something from scratch. Luckily, with the EDNF, there's, it's financially stable. It has employees already and people working for it, and it was easy to take that. I should not say easy. It's easier to take that and expand it by adding international staff and an international board and an international focus rather than completely building something brand new. Uh, a big part of this is timeline. You know, the longer we wait to do the things that we need to do, the longer it's going to be for people to get the treatment, the improved medical outcomes, the improved quality of life that we're trying to deliver for EDSers globally. And if we were to start a brand new organization, we would just be that much more delayed. So this is the route that ultimately we, we ended up taking. And I think over time, you're going to see this more and more global and, and 
less and less of viewed as something that is just coming out of the United States. And a big part of that is, you know, our co-executive director is not even in the United States. She's in London, as are many, as are many of our board members are spread around the world. And the board members are ultimately the ones that lead the organization. They're responsible for it. They call the shots and they're working for you all over the world. And I'd just like to add to that that, you know, I think we should be very, very grateful to EDNF for giving us the opportunity and the, the, the platform to do this from. And and I hope we never forget the roots of EDNF, but I in turn I hope you forget that it was an American charity in you know, in that sense, because we really, you know, actions and words, we will show everybody that this truly has an international face and international mission. Um, and 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 show everybody that that's what our intention is. But I think we should, and I am very grateful to EDNF for making this possible, for bringing me on um, as a, as a member of staff to make this possible and work with people like Sandy and Shane and and other medical professionals because you know without them this would have been a much longer road and we wouldn't get you know got to where we are and we're already starting with a base that's a good one, um, an excellent one and you know we've got an incredible new mission that's really exciting and never been seen anywhere you know within the EDS world so it is new it is a brand new international charity that is exactly what it is but we're stepping off a platform for another wonderful charity that was EDNF and I think that that's that can only be a good thing. A related question uh, will there still be an EDS UK? The answer is yes very much so uh, in fact, they're major contributors to the international symposium effort. And uh, we fully expect to be working with them directly on operations both within and outside of, of the United Kingdom. I mean, it's very, it's too early to tell how those, but what that's going to look like. But as of now, Lara, you're, you're a trustee at EDS UK, correct? I'm, I'm not a trustee, no, but um, I, I was a member of staff there for five years. I still have a great relationship with everyone there um, and, um, you know, still in communication with them uh, regularly. And I know that they're very excited about the society and keen to be part of our efforts. Um, and, you know, we, we would definitely be working together, but there is still absolutely an EDS UK. And, you know, it's important, you know, yes, this is replacing as such EDNF, but it's not it's not replacing the job of the national charities. That's essential for this to work. You know, if you kind of see us as overarching and looking after all the national charities together so that everyone is talking and, and able to serve the community, um, it's, it's not our intention to replace that. That's it's, it's essential that that still exists, and that's why we, you know, we want to expand and, and uh, build on the existing U.S groups that are already there to, to enable them to, to have the same thing. So yes, EDS UK will still be there. <laughs> Great. And we're, get, we're getting near the top of the hour, so uh, there are a couple of questions that are research specific. Uh, people would like to know if we can speak a little more to the research plan, uh, where we're going to be going with research post-symposium, Etc. I know you've touched on this a bit, Lara, but maybe, maybe we could. Um, so we we have, you know, our, the way that the um, board is going to be set up is that we have our board that's focused on raising lots of money and la ra raising lots of awareness. And uh, Sandy is the chair of that board. And then we have a scientific and medical board that is just focused on, you know, bringing the content to uh, the conferences and events that we do, making sure that they are the correct the correct things to do but mainly research. And what we will do is sit down and say, right, you know, this is how much money we have, these are the priorities, and this is what we should do. Go out and fund for, you know, research proposals that come in. And our first meeting is in May, the, the day after the symposium, and that will be fresh, you know, one of the subject titles which everyone can see openly on the agenda that's uh, online on the symposium website, eds2016.org is our agenda and it says on their future research and where we're going next because that's just as essential because what we've learned through this process is how much needs to be done and we you know that the rarer types of EDS need a lot of focus and attention 
other areas that we already have proposals in for, uh, you know, uh, you know, the GI symptoms, fatigue, pain, you know, there's a, there's a lot we need to do. But I can't say it enough, <laughs> we can't do it without money. We just can't. And, you know, we're giving everything that is needed, everything, the doctors and the willing to do this, the labs to do this, but they can't be paid with thin air. And we're going to go out and seek corporate donors and uh, grants um, and large potential donors and givers, but but really this is where we need everyone to come together because it's, you know, we, we need a lot of money, millions, millions and millions of dollars to make the changes that we need. And that sounds scary, but, you know, I think the average income of a good national charity is between 500000 and, you know, at most a million dollars. And that's lovely and that, that will support people to a level and put on events, but that's not going to be able to do the research that's needed. And um, that's what we want to change. So I cannot tell you enough how desperate we are for funding. We are very, very much in need of money to make this all happen. And uh, anything that anyone can do to help that, if they have any ideas of contacts, corporate you know, networking that they can set me up with, we're here and ready. I will sit in as many meetings as is needed uh, as will Shane, and you know we're all ready to take responsibility to do this, but we need your help. So please do get in touch, because the research proposals are there ready, and the people to do them are waiting. Okay, thank you very much, Lara. There are a few more questions. Please, for any of you whose questions weren't answered, uh, please email us or call us. Facebook us, just get in connect, contact with us however you need to, and we'll get those answered. Uh, and I think we'll end here. Laura, thank you so much for, for presenting. Thank you. Laura Bloom. Thank you. Uh, I'm Shane Robinson. We're the, the co-executive directors of, of the Elder Stanlow Society, and we're looking forward to getting started in May. <laughs>